Hello and thanks for joining us from our studios in Israel. Coming up in today's newscast, Israel boosts security as the newest wave of terror continues. The family of a fallen Israeli soldier fights to get his body back from Hamas, and Israel is set to make its mark at the World Baseball Classic. I'm Natasha Kirchuk here with the latest news in Israel. As the latest surge in Palestinian terror attacks continue, Israeli defense sources say the 12-year-old Palestinian girl who was shot by security guards yesterday was trying to carry out a suicide attack. The girl is a resident of the West Bank and she was wounded in the leg after refusing to halt. She told guards that she had come to die. As a nearly year-old wave of Palestinian street attacks flares up again, Israeli police insist that they open fire and shoot to kill only as a last resort in life-threatening situations. At the command center here in the Jerusalem district, uh, we are manning both uh, by our police personnel and officers, as well as the cameras and technology that we're using to cover every part of the city, with our emphasis being on the old city in the center of town. We're both looking for suspects, responding, we dispatch our different units almost uh, instantly whenever we have any specific individuals or any individuals that look suspicious in any way whatsoever. Security forces are particularly on high alert in Jerusalem's old city, which remains a flashpoint of violence. The response of the Israeli police is absolutely proportional. We have to respond according to the threats. Unfortunately, when we're seeing Palestinians waving knives and attacking our police officers and border police that are on the front lines, when we have no choice, we'll have to open fire and only at the last option will we open fire and shoot to kill. But of course what we've seen is that the Palestinians have unfortunately approached our officers at close ranges where our officers have to respond and react by split-second reactions. They're trained and capable of doing that. And if so, our police officers will make arrests. If there is no situation where we can't make arrests, then we'll have to open fire when our officers are in a life-threatening situation. Jerusalem resident Atef Zugayar says that after the last attack, the police closed down all of the shops in the area and the bus station. The police are in the bus station. They are in the bus station. They are in the bus station. They are in the bus station. There was no one incident in which the spike can be pinpointed, but this time of year has always been sensitive, coming just after the Muslim Eid al-Adha holiday and just before the Jewish New Year. The current wave of unrest erupted a year ago, during which time 34 Israelis and four foreign nationals have been murdered. Israeli officials are blaming the violence on official incitement from the Palestinian Authority, which in turn blames Jerusalem for the lack of progress in peace negotiations. One Arab resident of the old city in Hebron believes the recent spate may be revenge for relatives killed by Israeli forces. Since last October, 218 Palestinians died in violent incidents in the West Bank, East Jerusalem and Gaza. والله أعتقد إنها شغلة طارئة لأن زي ابن رجب هذا ابن عمه اللي راح اللي راح يمكن هذول جايين يسدوا الابن عمه مراحهم بالتنين. Another resident commented that the Palestinians now experienced increased hardships because of the deteriorating situation. Zaidan Charabati says it's more difficult to pass through Israeli military checkpoints now than ever. كل هذا على رؤوس السكان اللي هي ساكنة في المنطقة كل نكد من المستوطنين ومن الجيش. وتعزيزات الجيش الأجهزة إضافية يعني صار عنا تقريبا يا وحدتين يا ثلاثة في المنطقة وكله تنكيل على أطفالنا وعلى علينا يعني هاي إحنا تقريبا صارنا ثلاثة أيام بنكد كل يوم بنتو بنجع المحسوم هنا بنكد علينا بسكوا الحاجز بنطلع من لف ثلاثة أربعة كيلو تنيش خش على البيت مع إنه هيو البيت ثلاثة عشرين متر نبقى في البيت no Israeli civilians or security personnel have been killed in the latest cycle of violence. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has held what are likely to be his last round of talks with the outgoing U.S. President Barack Obama as they met on the sidelines of the annual United Nations General Assembly in New York. This will give us an opportunity to talk uh, about uh, the challenges that arise out of uh, situations like Syria. Uh, I'll also be interested in hearing uh, from the Prime Minister uh, his assessment of uh, conditions uh, within Israel uh, and uh, in the West Bank. Uh, obviously, uh, our hearts go out to those who've been injured, uh, both 
Israeli and Palestinian. Uh, clearly, uh, there is uh, great danger of uh, not just terrorism, but also flare-ups of violence. Uh, we do have concerns around settlement activity as well. Um, and our hope uh, is that we can continue to be an effective partner with Israel uh, in finding uh, a path to peace. Obviously, uh, I'm only going to be president for another few months. Uh, the Prime Minister will, uh, will uh, be there quite a bit longer. Uh, and our hope will be that uh, uh, in these conversations we get a sense of uh, how uh, Israel sees the next few years, uh, what the opportunities are and what the challenges are, uh, in order to assure that uh, uh, we keep alive uh, the possibility of uh, a stable, secure Israel uh, at peace with its neighbors uh, and uh, a Palestinian homeland uh, that uh, meets the aspirations of, uh, of their people. Despite his often rocky eight-year relationship with Obama, Netanyahu said he appreciated their many talks about challenges facing his country. I want to thank you for the many meetings we've had in which we discussed how to confront common challenges and how to uh, seize common opportunities. The greatest challenge is, of course, the unremitting fanaticism. Uh, the greatest opportunity is to advance a durable peace. That's a goal that I and the people of Israel will never give up on. We've been uh, fortunate that in pursuing these two tasks, Israel has no greater friend than the United States of America, and America has no greater friend than Israel. Ahead of the summit, White House Deputy National Security Advisor Ben Rhodes made it clear that Obama would raise concerns about Israeli settlement activity. We do so because we believe that ultimately, uh, Israel will be most secure um, if there is a two-state solution uh, and they can live side by side uh, in peace and security with uh, an independent and sovereign uh, Palestine. U.S. officials have held out the possibility that Obama may still lay out the rough parameters of an Israeli-Palestinian peace accord after the November 8th presidential election but before leaving office in January. Many analysts don't believe Netanyahu will pay much attention to American opposition to the settlements. The Israeli leader allegedly believes it's a myth that expanding Israeli settlements is an obstacle to Middle East peace, and that that myth will eventually disappear. Professor Harold Rhodes served as an Islamist affairs advisor to the U.S. Department of Defense between 1982 and 2010. The prominent Middle East expert was even studying in Iran at the time of the Islamist revolution back in 1979 and is fluent in Farsi. ILTV's Aaron Viner asked Professor Rhodes for his insight into how Tehran views last year's nuclear agreement as well as the Islamic Republic's core beliefs about the United States and Israel. In the, when there was a time of the Americans versus the Soviets, there was something called MAD, Mutual Assured Destruction. Neither side wanted to use nuclear weapons because it would be assured that the other side would kill them. For the present regime in Iran, it's the opposite. It's an inducement. The, the battle from an Iranian point of view is who has the right type of Islam, Shiite, which was the rulers of Iran are, or Sunnis. Now for us, this battle started, by the way, 1,400 years ago. For us, bygones be bygones. Leave the past and deal with the future, deal with the present. Not in the Middle East. There's no such thing as letting bygones be bygones. And so the Iranian government is trying to use whatever it has to go over the heads of the Sunni rulers in the Arab world to say, we're the ones who are going to destroy Israel. Israel is your issue. We don't really care about the truth is that the Shiites don't care about Jerusalem. It's a Sunni innovation. It's not holy from a Shiite point of view. The Shiites hate Jerusalem. Now, if that's the case, why does the Iranian government, why is it so concerned about Jerusalem? It's really simple. The Iranian government is trying to take the issues of most concern to the Sunnis, and Jerusalem is to the Sunnis, and take those issues and steal them, steal the agenda. And if it wins, and if it can destroy Israel with a nuclear bomb, then it's very clear that 
They're showing the rest of the Muslim world that our way, the Shiite way, is the right way, and the Sunni way is wrong. This sounds esoteric to us, but this is exactly what is going on in the war between the Iranian government and the rest of the Shiite world. You asked about the agreement that Obama signed with the Iranians. In the Middle East, written agreements mean nothing. They are nothing more than a step on the way to achieve one's goals. The Iranian government violated instantly the agreement. If there is one, you know, we have no, no one has ever really seen the conditions or what's in that agreement. So no one really knows. What we do know is what has been publicized in English and Persian, Farsi, the language of Iran. The Iranian one is three times as long. And Iran makes no commitments in the Iranian version. It is all passive voice. Um, it is thought that um, if this happens, this will be done. It doesn't say by whom. The English language one says exactly what it is. What has really happened from an Iranian point of view and a Middle Eastern point of view is that Obama has submitted to the will of the Iranian government. And everything that the Iranians have done to violate this agreement in the meantime is looked upon, and Obama says, oh, it doesn't matter. That is understood in the Middle East as American giving in. As the great Professor Bernard Lewis, who's 100 years old now, says, America has proven that it is a harmless enemy and an unreliable ally. And that is why so many of the Sunni Muslim Arab leaders have such a good relationship with the state of Israel. They can no longer rely on Obama's American leadership. And they're looking to someone who's strong. And Israel is strong. Israel keeps getting stronger. Israel knows who, what it is. It knows what it stands for. In spite of all the craziness that goes on in here um, in Israel, this is a country dedicated to Israeli Jewish values. And they, Israel stands up for what it believes. And the surrounding Arab leaders know this. And that is why they are working so well with the Israelis today. The parents of a fallen Israeli soldier whose body is being held captive by Hamas have long been campaigning to get their son's remains back. But now it looks like they're taking their campaign to an international stage by camping out in front of the United Nations headquarters in New York City. The Jewish Channel has given us a scoop. As the United Nations General Assembly convened earlier this week, across the street in Tudor City Place, the mother of a fallen Israeli soldier beseeched the international community to help secure the release of her son's remains. Adar was our beloved son, but could have been your son or anyone's child. Please consider for a moment what it, be, it would be like to suffer such a loss, to be robbed of your child and his future, and also to be robbed of the opportunity to properly grieve over him with your family and your friends and your community. Please think how much sorrow that adds to the pain we are feeling. Joined by the rest of her family and numerous elected officials and community leaders, Professor Leah Golden was speaking at a press conference organized by the Jewish Community Relations Council of New York to demand that the UN broker the release of her son and another fallen soldier who was killed by Hamas and whose body was taken, Oron Shaul, and two Israeli citizens who are being held by Hamas, Avira Mengistu and Hisham al-Sayed. Both Mengistu and al-Sayed reportedly suffer from mental illness. While Arun Shaul was killed during 2014's Israel-Gaza war, known in Israel as Operation Protective Edge, Hadar Golden was killed by Hamas on August 1, 2014, in what was supposed to be a UN-brokered ceasefire. For this reason, JCRC's Michael Miller laid blame on the UN. In truth, Hadar was not a victim of the war between Hamas and Israel. Hadar was a victim of a UN ceasefire. Therefore, the United Nations bears responsibility for returning Hadar Golden home to his family for a proper burial. Israel's Consul General in New York, Danny Dayan, and New York City Comptroller Scott Stringer held the UN similarly accountable. 
But what I would say to the UN today is this is what you build for. This is what you should be known for, to create a level playing field, to cut out the nonsense, to call out Hamas for exactly who they are, a terrorist organization that is bringing great, great sadness and harm to a family that loves their soldier's son so very much. And we are not asking the states of the world to demand from Hamas. We are demanding the states of the world to coerce Hamas to comply. They have the means. They have the ways to do, do, to do it. They need just the will. As part of this renewed effort to pressure the international community to secure the release of the four Israelis, you, U.S. Congressman uh, Elliot Engel, I, New York State Assembly honor. Member David Weprin, and New York State Senator Martin Golden announced they are each sponsoring resolutions in their respective legislative bodies to demand the release of these captive Israelis. Together, we seek to strongly express New York's support for the State of Israel in that resolution as well. We are also united in our support of the Golden, Shaul, Mangistu, and El Sayed families. Together, we issue a call to action. Together, out of common morality and basic humanity and common decency, we demand that Hadar's body be returned to his family, to his friends, to the country he loved, and for which he lost his life. But for all of these political efforts, a diverse set of community leaders stressed that this issue goes beyond politics. This is not about BDS. This is not about a two-state solution. This is not about diplomats or bullets. This is about right and wrong. And so to the families, we're here today, we are standing on an American principle, but a universal human principle, that families deserve closure. Urging the international community not to forget her son, Professor Golden took the opportunity of the press conference to remember Hadar as an artist, a poet, and an inspiration to others. Hadar used to say, you have two options in life, to think of yourself or to do great things. We call upon all people who believed in human rights, all people who embrace the highest ideals uh, of the great religions of the world, and all the people who can feel com compassion for the loss of a wonderful, loving, and devoted son to assist us at the family of Oron Shaul in, in securing the return of our son's body for the proper burial in their homeland Israel. Reporting from New York, for the Jewish Channel and ILTV, I'm Rebecca Hunig friedman Israeli technology usually provides us with a glimpse into the future of our world, but now it's done just the opposite, giving us a look into our biblical history. Scholars have just virtually unwrapped an ancient burned scroll that was too fragile to unfold and have discovered that the Hebrew Bible has remained the same for the last 2,000 years. The charred 2,000-year-old parchment was brought to a preservation lab in Jerusalem last year by the archaeologists who discovered it in Ein Gedi near the Dead Sea back in 1970. It was scanned with an X-ray-based microcomputed tomography, kind of like a 3D version of the CT imagery used in hospitals. Computer modeling was then used to virtually smooth out the document so it could be deciphered. Everyone was astonished to see passages from the book of Leviticus, and without a doubt, the first physical evidence that the Hebrew Bible used today goes back 2,000 years. Until now, the earliest known fragments are from the 8th century. And what's perhaps just as exciting is that this biblical treasure wasn't found in a desert cave like the Dead Sea Scrolls, but instead for the first time in history came from the holy ark of an ancient synagogue, where it was once stored for prayers. Israel will be facing off against Great Britain tonight in the opening game of the final qualifying round of the World Baseball Classic. The ILTV team is in Brooklyn for the games, and we have the scoop on what to expect. This year's Team Israel may likely be the strongest squad of Jewish players to ever be assembled in the history of the Israeli League. And tonight they're aiming to reach the next round of the World Baseball Classic. I think that we'll have a really good shot to, to win, and we have a good team, a lot of experience. Um, we're going to come out there and try our hardest tonight. We look pretty good. We got, uh, I mean, a lot of ex big leaguers. We have um, some talented players, young guys that look, that look pretty good. I feel pretty good. Excited to get it going. Uh, you know, I've been preparing for the last month or so. You know, I haven't been in the game since last year, but I'm excited to get back on the mound, compete, and uh, 
bring some notoriety to baseball in, uh, in Israel. The club's roster for the qualifying tournament includes nine major league veterans of recent seasons, almost all of which are playing in the minors to try to return to the big games. Team Israel is expected to win tonight's game against Great Britain as they compete in Coney Island, Brooklyn, which could have a major impact on the Israeli baseball scene. Well, first of all, we get to go to Korea to participate in the next round of the World Baseball Classic. Between the qualifier and the actual tournament, um, there's going to be lots of press, lots of attention. Israelis are going to start paying more attention to baseball. Hopefully kids will start signing up for their local clubs in Israel and start to play baseball and just continue to build that, that uh, identity in Israel that Israelis can be baseball fans. Baseball is part of Israeli culture and it's just a, a, a slow process, but winning this qualifier could go a long way for that. Over 7,000 people will be in the stadium to watch the game, and many of those in the crowd are expected to hail from day school and yeshiva groups and local synagogues. After all, even though baseball isn't very popular in Israel, there are lots of international Jews that idolize American Jewish baseball players. I think uh, it went well. I mean, I think it was important for us to get together, get, get the guys to know each other, uh, to hear the stories of the guys who went through it last time and had a heartbreak loss and what it meant to them to be part of it and bring that enthusiasm to the new guys. So it was an exciting part, getting to know everybody, eat dinner, work out together, and uh, we're looking forward to getting going tonight. Officials with the Israeli Association of Baseball believe the prestige of advancing to the next round will not only boost the reputation of baseball as a sport back in Israel, but will also lead to more funds being invested in coaching and player development programs. Yet the team's players say they're just focusing on trying to win. Well, like anything, you're a team, you have a goal, goal in mind to win. And you know, they had a bad taste in the mouth losing in extra innings to Spain, who they previously lost. I know the ultimate goal is to bring uh, awareness, baseball globally, especially in Israel. But at the same time, we are competitors and we, we want to win this thing. The team's coach, Nate Fish, is trying to keep things in perspective, even though the Israeli baseball team has made huge strides over the past decade. Look, both of those teams are really good. Um, this team has a little more experience. It has more guys with major league experience. Um, but what it comes down to is going out and, and playing good baseball. It's such a small sample size. It's hard to say, okay, we're the better team, so we're definitely going to win. It didn't happen last time. So what we have to do this time is just go out and right from the start, just play good baseball, you know, foot on the gas pedal, as they say, the whole time. So it's that time of the year again when Israeli mailmen make their most symbolic runs of the entire year. Just before the Jewish high holidays, the Israeli Postal Service makes a very special stop in Jerusalem's old city to place dozens of letters for God between the ancient stones of the Western Wall. This is the holiest place on earth for the Jewish people because it's a part of the retaining wall where both biblical temples once stood. Some of the letters were sent from Russia, others from Africa, Europe, and the United States. Several are sent to the Almighty Himself, while others are addressed to our dear Father in Heaven or Jesus. It's long been the tradition for visitors to tuck notes of prayer and wishes in the cracks of the Western Wall. Nowadays, you can also send an online message to God. And the Western Wall Heritage Foundation says that so far, printed versions of a whopping 517,000 messages have been brought to the holy site. While people all over the world like to complain about the slow pace in getting their mail, let's face it, it wasn't that hard for Israel's postal service to bring the mail. Because after all, here in Israel, it's really just a local delivery to an address that hasn't changed in thousands of years. And now for our Hebrew word of the day. There's nothing like getting home from work to find a big package on your doorstep, so today's word is doa, which means mail in Hebrew. In most parts of the world, the mailman drives by in his truck every day to drop off your doa. But who drops off all the letters being written to God? Here in Israel, our post office makes a special run to the Western Wall for the people who aren't here to share their doa. And that's not all. With the holidays just around the corner, if you're looking for a great way to give back, we have just the idea for you. And it also comes all packaged up. Instead of sending a letter in the mail, why not send food, clothes, or books to those in need? We're sure that whatever you send in the doa will make somebody smile. All right, let's go ahead and take a look at the weather forecast. The weekend is finally here and with a big surprise. Friday is expected to be rainy, giving us some of the scattered showers that we could have used during the hot summer. But don't worry, the temperature will still remain high at 82 degrees. Saturday should be sunny again with a high of 85. 
All right, everybody, that's it for today's news. Today's exchange rate is 3.77 shekels to the American dollar. Remember to sign up for our daily newsletter at ILTV.TV, and don't forget to check out our evening update every night at 8 p.m. Eastern Time. Thanks for watching, and see you tonight.